Good morning, Grace family. We are so glad that you are here with us on this beautiful day. Would you please stand?
Even in the storms, I'll follow you. Even in the storms, I'll follow you. And I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. When I see the wicked prospering, when I feel I have no voice to sing, even though I want, I'll follow you. Even though I want, I'll follow you. And I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. I believe and I will follow you. When I find myself so far from home And you lead me somewhere I don't want to go Even in my death I'll follow you Even in my death I'll follow you And when I come to end this race I've run and I receive the prize that Christ has won. I will be with you in paradise. I will be with you in paradise. Oh, 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 oh. I believe everything that you say. that you say you are I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part I believe and I will follow you I believe and I will follow Your heart 
says, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. Um, I've actually been reading in Ephesians 3, and that's where we get that lyric. It says that you may be rooted and founded in love. That's Paul's prayer for the church, and um, that's his prayer for us, and my prayer for us. And so as we sing this last song, which said, rather have Jesus, I've been thinking about what it means that God's love for us is our foundation. Um, it's the starting point. Right? It's the structure upon which all else is built. And uh, we can often get into ways of thinking that, oh, well, if I just do more, if I sacrifice more, if I do better, right, then I will achieve this sense of God loving me. Right? Then I'll, I'll be able somehow to, to grasp or understand or feel that love of Jesus for me in my heart if I just do more. But no, the Bible says that that is our foundation. It's the starting point. Nothing can grow without that. Um, so I, I just want us to sit and med meditate, us to meditate on that, that we are loved fully and wholly um, with a love that was willing to, to, to go to the cross for each and every single one of us. And because of that, we are able to say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold, right? I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold, right? We don't have to like force ourselves to say it, right? The root of that, the soil upon which, soil from which that grows is the love of Jesus for us. So, Lord, oh, that was weird. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would fill us with um, a realization of your love. Um, God, we, we just sang, show us who you are. And we, we want to see you more clearly. We, understand your, we want to understand your love for us more deeply. Um, that it might be our foundation, our firm foundation, the soil from which all of our devotion and, and our service grows. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would fill us with a revelation of who you are um, and your love for us this morning as we continue to sing, Lord. Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today I'd rather have Jesus and men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than a worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be
Lord, again, we ask that you would help us to see this morning. First, um, first that you would reveal your great love for us. And second, Lord, that you would help us to see that any foundation other than you, uh, Lord, as, as the poet says, is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All right, there's no other structure, no other foundation that we can build our lives upon that will support us, that will give us joy, that will give us fulfillment, that will give us purpose. Only you can do that because you made us and our hearts are restless until they come to rest in you. And Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Grace family. Welcome. All of you who are visiting for the first time today, welcome to our worship service. I have to be sorry. I have to apologize. We sing this great song about wanting to have Jesus and rather being with him. Instead, you get me. After I'm done talking, you do get the pleasure of hearing my beloved wife, Megan, who is the director of our Vacation Bible School. Yeah? <laughs> but before we get there, I have just a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first of all, immediately following this service, we have a luncheon downstairs in the Activity Center. I believe it is a breakfast, or not breakfast, I dream of breakfast, every meal of every day. No, sandwiches, a sandwich bar, potluck. Uh, please come and join us. If you're visiting, make sure you come and join us downstairs. Uh, find some friendly faces to meet and have a wonderful conversation with us. Uh, everyone is also invited on April 28th after our service for the annual business meeting. Uh, we'll vote on budgets, nominees for this upcoming year's leadership. We'll also get key ministry updates from Pastor Adam, Austin Lohan, the chairman, tr uh, trustee of the chairman, the chairman of the trustee board, <laughs> uh, Roxanne Evans, our director of children's ministry, and Aaron Williams, our director of youth ministry here at GBC. Um, Lots of key information. We would love to have all of you come and join us, even if you're visiting. Again, that's just two weeks away, so make sure you're here for that. And with that, I will hand it off to Megan, and you all know that if she's up here, it's a VBS update. <laughs> Good morning. Well, I can't believe VBS is less than two months away. This year's theme is Kingdom Agents Investigate Your Mission, His Story. VBS will be held on June 10th through the 13th from 9 to noon. Our key verse is Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. This summer, campers will investigate clues that will lead them to God's fingerprints on all of creation, revealing his plan to offer new life to each of us through Jesus. We will be highlighting different children who did great things in their community, showing the kids that they can do great things for the kingdom of Christ. Campers will be rotating through skits, crafts, Bible time, music, evidence lab, recreation, and snacks. However, to make this possible, you, we need your help. We have 139 campers registered, kids who need to hear and experience the love of Jesus. In order to make VBS the best experience for these kids, we are asking you to consider becoming a group leader. What is a group leader, you ask? Group leaders are with a group of campers helping them rotate through the different areas of VBS. You might be thinking this sounds like a lot of work. I'm not equipped to do that. I'm here to tell you, you can do it, and this is why. Each area you will visit will be planned and led by its own leader. All the work is done for you. All you need to do is come alongside the kids, support, and encourage them. Every group leader will have a junior helper, many who have been through VBS countless times. Each group leader will be in the same group with other group leaders. You will have the support of one another throughout the day. Now I know what you're thinking. What if the kids ask me something and I don't know how to answer? Well, don't worry. We have a truth tent just for that reason, a place where you and the kids can go where there will always be someone willing to answer those questions for you. With all of the support, you'll be fully equipped to come alongside your group of kids. Now I know what you're asking. How do I become a group leader? It's easy. The Grace Connect email that has a, has a link for all volunteers. You can find me after the service or you can call the office to volunteer. 
I'm so grateful for all the faithful volunteers who have made BBS possible over the years. We want, we want you to be a part of this amazing ministry devoted to sharing the love of Jesus with so many children. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the update, Megan. Uh, let's pray for Vacation Bible School as we continue worship this morning. Lord, what a day. We, just, we come and we gather now and we pause to recognize who you are. We remember what you've done. We recognize, Lord, what you're doing right now. And we gather, Lord, to remember the promises that you've given us of a brighter, better future. Lord, we lay both the joys and the fresh frustrations of our lives at your feet. And remember, Lord, that your grace is enough. Lord, it saddens our heart as we continue to see war escalating in the Middle East, and we pray, Father God, that you would protect the innocent and you'd heal the wounded, that you would provide for the needs of all of your beloved children there, and Lord, we beg and plead that you would bring peace. Father, we also recognize what you're doing here locally, and we, as we prepare for this vacation Bible school season here at GBC, Lord, we are mindful, are reminded and mindful of what you said, that the harvest is plenty and the workers are few. And so, Lord, you asked us to come to you to ask you to send out the workers, and so here we are. 139 kids registered to come, maybe more on the way, and that certainly sounds like plenty. Lord, we thank you for the harvest that will, that's coming up, and we pray, Lord, that you will prepare our hearts each for each and every adult and youth volunteer that's there so that we would be ready to share your forgiveness and your healing and hope with these children and their families. May your grace be shared with them. Lord, as we continue in our worship today, we ask that your spirit would soften our hearts to your message that, you're, that you've got prepared for us, Lord. Bless your servant, Adam, Lord, and all God's children said... And all, and all God's kingdom kids, headed off into kingdom kids. Woohoo! Woo Last week I talked a little bit about the eclipse, and how the universe and the, the world, the earth and the moon and its distance and all that is fine-tuned to reveal God. Well, I can report to you that I went down to Indiana, to Indianapolis, just a little bit south, uh, to see the eclipse in totality in the clearest sky that we could find. We made the decision early in the morning to drive to wherever the clouds seemed to be the least, and we wound up in Franklin, Indiana. We got there early, we set up. I had no idea what to expect. I had never seen a total eclipse before. Who here today went to see the totality uh, last week? One, two, three people. Three people. Okay, who's seen a totality in the past? Okay, we got some more. All right, I had no idea what to expect. So we got there early, we waited, and uh, you know in the beginning, sort of not uneventful, even as it begins to happen, but when that moment occurred... Something happened within me that I had not expected. I had not expected it to be such a deeply moving existential moment. I felt so much like a creature for the first time in a long time. You know, you're trying to take pictures because you don't want to miss out, out on it, but it, it doesn't capture what's happening. It seems as if there is something in the human heart, at least what it felt like to me, that is something like a compass point. And when we see something of such otherworldly grandeur, something happens. It points and declares God. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. There's another one in 2026 in Spain. So if you speak Spanish and you're interested in coming with me, I think we're going to go because it was, it was awesome. But we don't need an eclipse to have these moments of sort of existential questioning, do we? I mean, we have them sort of all the time, I think, especially in those moments when we're working hard and we're wondering if the juice is worth the squeeze. 
we're wondering if all of the struggle that, for which we are struggling is paying off. Is it really getting for me what I had hoped that it would bring? Last week, we talked about what we were made for. Where does my value lie? Today, we're going to discuss the very meaning of life and our search and our quest here on this earth to find it. There's a man in the Bible that we're going to follow along with. He has had many of the same questions, and he was generous enough to document his journey for us so that we can take this quest along with him. At the end of his quest and subsequent analysis, he comes to a conclusion. That conclusion is that the significance of our existence, or in other words, the meaning of our life, is to live in humble dependence upon our Creator. (laughs) We were made as creatures to love and be loved by a good, benevolent God. It is when our focus is there, it's when we live our life with our primary focus at that place, looking at life through that lens, that everything will come into focus. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to go through this book. It's in the Old Testament, right near Psalms. And we are going to walk through this book. It's 13 chapters. I'm not going to read 13 chapters of verses, I can assure you. But we are going to read, and we are going to see what Solomon, this is the one who wrote it, had to say about this quest. Verse 1. So first we're going to talk about the man. Verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. The first question is, is who is the preacher? Because he doesn't say the words of Solomon. He actually, in Hebrew, says the words of koalet, and koalet means one who is something like a speaker in an assembly, one who gathers a congregation and declares things to that congregation, so it's not too hard to see how they came away with the translation preacher. It is one who gathers wisdom and declares it unto those who are listening. It makes sense because in 1 Kings 3, Solomon was asleep and God appeared to him in a dream. And God asked Solomon, it's like the ultimate genie moment. It's like, I'll give you anything you want. Tell me what you want, and I will give it to you. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. And God said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you so much wisdom, you will be the wisest man to ever walk the earth. And on top of that wisdom, I'll give you great riches and success as well. This is actually a very, very powerful question when we ask, think about it. What do you want? If God appeared to you in a dream and said, what do you want? What would you say? I think if we are willing to be honest and open to sometimes the ugly truth of what we find, that we can find a powerful source, a powerful location within our heart that will reveal places of, honestly, idolatry. What do we want? I wish I were happy. Well, Maybe we're making happiness our primary motive. I wish that I didn't have to suffer anymore. Maybe we're idolizing the idea of peace apart from God. What do you want? But lest we think that perfect wisdom would lead to a perfect life, we must remember that Solomon was a perfect sinner. Solomon's wisdom was not always applied in the best way, just like our wisdom from the scripture and from our life is not always applied in the best way. As Solomon's years went by, he lived a life seeking pleasure and power and the often attendant strife that comes with it. I mean, the man had 700 wives. Well, 300 wives and 700 concubines. That's a lot of drama. (laughs) But what we read today, what he wrote near the end of his life, gives us perspective on time, on his experience, and on the suffering that came with his quest for meaning. So first we're going to see in verse 2, what Solomon has to say. He sort of gives a preface to everything, and this is his assessment of his life. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 
What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? I mean, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things, yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, it is all vanity, a striving after wind. What a bummer. (laughs) I mean, what brought Solomon to this dreadful perspective? He's saying that nothing's new. It's all a circle. It all comes back around. What has been will be. The wind goes from one place and it comes back. Nothing's new. Nothing's changed. It's all vanity of vanity. What he's saying, vanity. The word in Hebrew is hevel. Hevel means wind or breath, vapor, a mist. The idea is that it doesn't have any substance. You can't hold it. You can't grab it. It lacks staying power. It just flies away on its own. Solomon's words reveal the logical outcome of a life lived for things under the sun. A life lived for things here on earth instead of that which is above. He who is above. Maybe you're at this place today asking yourself, what does this all mean? We've come to a place of cynicism, like sounds like Solomon has here, where you've decided that there is no meaning. It all means nothing. So what's the point? Maybe everything you've tried has not gotten you any closer to the happiness, the fulfillment, and the joy you're so desperately seeking. Next week, we're going to talk specifically about that idea. What does it mean to be truly fulfilled? But today, let's go with Solomon on his quest to find significance. So starting in verse 16... Solomon moves on and he begins first with the vanity of wisdom. Verse 16 through 18. Solomon says, I said in my heart I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. What Solomon is saying, in other words, is I tried to understand what is right, what is wrong, what's good living, what is not. I tried to gain more knowledge, apply it to my life. I tried to do all these things. At the end of the day, it came back to nothing. Vanity of vanities. This sort of runs into loggerheads with something that it seems is natural from the rest of our understanding of the Bible, that wisdom is good. We want wisdom. There's entire books, Proverbs, written about wisdom and how important wisdom is. Knowledge from above is what he's talking about in terms of wisdom. Knowledge from above that reveals how to live as reality is, from God's perspective. But Solomon here specifically is speaking of something different. And the hint is how he uses the word wisdom and knowledge. In Hebrew, when you're reading, and you'll often see this, and when I point this out, if you get in your Bible, you will see this everywhere, that there's an idea of something called parallelism, where the author will say one thing and then change the way they say it in just a little bit, but they're really saying the same thing, okay? What it does is it seeks, in most times, to advance what the author is saying. So Solomon is doing that right here. What he's saying ultimately 
what we would say is knowledge. Getting more information. More, how does this world work? More, but there's, it's always never enough. Book upon book is written. We can study and study and seek more degrees and seek more knowledge. At the end of the day, we never come to an end. What's crazy about it is that Solomon says nothing's new anyway. So we seek after something that is said slightly differently, maybe with a little different emphasis, so we can tell ourselves we're growing. But at the end of the day, if we're doing it with the wrong posture in our heart, if we're doing it for the wrong reasons, it is a waste, vanity of vanities. It's amazing to me, and I feel it in myself as well, so I'm not criticizing the power of things like YouTube, where you have the whole world at your hands. Knowledge on every, I don't know how many things I've fixed, learned, tried to understand better from something like YouTube. The internet age has provided us ample opportunity to search for really whatever we want. Do we think we're any better off right now? I don't think so. A war in the Middle East is a pretty good indication that we're not any better off than we were. My son, I used to get a report from his internet usage, like how many hours in the last week. I think his highest hour was 86 hours in one week. 86 hours. And I went, so what is this, man? 86 hours. What? We went through YouTube, YouTube. You, and I sort of couldn't get mad at the kid because it was like interesting. You know, how do chemical reactions work? Four hours of lecture on chemical reactions. You know what I mean? Our pursuit of knowledge with the wrong posture in our heart, with the wrong desire for its application, will inevitably lead us to vanity. It will inevitably lead us to a place where we're always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. We're always seeking something new because it'll make us feel better about what we already know. I don't know how many times I've sat with people in counseling and coaching and discipleship. They ask me a question, they already know the answer. But often we seek new ways of saying things so that it feels different if our posture is not right before God. Where am I searching for this wisdom and knowledge? Solomon says, underneath the sun, here on earth. What is my disposition towards what I might find? Am I willing to face an uncomfortable truth? So at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves regarding knowledge and wisdom of this world. Am I seeking wisdom from one who is seeking wisdom in things under the sun? Because we so often will seek information from those who are looking in all the wrong places as well. Now it's secondhand earthly knowledge. That's not great. Our search needs to have its final analysis done in the light of God's word, of the revelation that there is a creator and we are a creature. And the one who can make sense of things that is here on earth apart from acknowledging the creator. The second, so vanity of knowledge, of wisdom. The second is the vanity of pleasure, chapter 2. Ecclesiastes 2.1 says, I said in my heart, come now, Solomon saying, I will test myself with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this is also vanity. As you read through the chapter, Solomon cheers his heart with wine and he builds great works and buildings and civil engineering projects. He builds gardens and parks and he plants fruit trees in those gardens and parks, and he accrues slaves and workers at this time so that his numbers and strength are accruing and accruing. He accrues wealth and great treasure. Verse 10, And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found, them, found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. He worked and he loved it. He kept working and building. Then I considered all that my hands had done. When he stood back and he looked, and all the toil that I expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity 
and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. If you look carefully, you see what Solomon does in chapter 2. He's seeking to recreate Eden. If you read chapter 2 in Ecclesiastes and compare it to chapter 1 and 2 in Genesis, you'll see that Solomon is seeking to recreate paradise for himself. And he's seeking to do it apart from God. And what is his declaration? Vanity of vanities. Striving after wind. I believe this is the very essence of our search for significance and meaning in this world. The sin that is so deeply lodged in our hearts and is not looking to go away anytime soon until we stand before God in perfection. We often will seek a respite here from the suffering and the consequences and the pain, looking for peace and shalom. Our sinful hearts, though, want it without God. We want the garden without the God. I mean, there's a million ways we seek significance and pleasure. We all have these things that we love. There's some big ones, you know, sort of the big category ones. But everyone has their own thing and their own combination of things that they derive pleasure from. Now, when I say this, just don't think of a pleasure in sort of negative sense, you know. Sometimes in the church, we use the word pleasure, and our initial posture is, oh, that's bad. It must be sinful, right? <laughs> but we were made to enjoy. We were made for pleasure. Pleasure is what God has given us as the, the draw to be drawn to him. Yet we, find, we seek our pleasure in other things. Even when we are seeking pleasure through the overtly sinful means, we're really seeking after the blessing and peace that comes from the presence of God alone. Drugs are not just a means to feel good, often misunderstood. People think that drug addicts do it because they want to get high to feel good. It's not. Pornography is just a way to feed the needs of the flesh and to satisfy some innate drive. It's not just that. Overshopping, hoarding, and every other thing under the sun that we use to distract ourselves from our suffering are just misguided attempts to find God's peace and happiness without God himself. There's nothing wrong with shopping, nothing wrong with sex, nothing wrong with drugs or feeling good in the sense that God has blessed us with lots of things. Some of those things are medications. God, you know, we read in the New Testament, I'll probably get some emails on this one. We read in the New Testament that we drink wine in the new kingdom. Jesus says, I'm not going to drink of the cup, a cup of the vine until I drink it again in the new kingdom. Wine was given to us for a good purpose. But if you're anything like me, ruin that privilege. <laughs> Why? Seeking significance and exemption, escape from the pain of this world apart from the God who created me. Seeking to find God. Didn't even know it. Third, Solomon goes on and says the vanity of, ESV calls it wise living. I sort of tweaked it a little bit. I want to call it something more like perfectionism. Okay, look at verse 14 through 17, chapter 2. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why then have I been so wise? He's saying, why have I tried to do everything just right if I cannot guarantee that what happened bad to him will not happen bad to me? And I said in my heart, this is, lost my spot. And I said in my heart, this is also vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all have been long forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done again under the sun was grievous to me, for it was all vanity and striving after wind. Human morality and judgment about what is right, what was wrong, how to live, how not to live, is just a means, again, to try to find significance in things under the sun. It's easy. I mean, sometimes it's easy for us to look at people who are not walking with the Lord and wonder about how they seem to achieve what appears to us to be a happy and well-adjusted life. Why do they have the things that we so struggle to have? 
Why do they, I mean, I, for me, it's like even sort of in a shallow means, some shallowness. It's like, well, why do they dress like that? I wish I could dress like that. Why do they look like that? Why do they never seem stressed out? Oh, they got their summer home. They got this thing. They got that thing. They just live their life. They have a great job, beautiful wife, bunch of kids who pay attention and listen, all of that. <laughs> why them? Here I'm seeking to root my life, and I know you can relate. Here we are seeking to root our lives in the truth of God's word. I mean, why are we here? We're trying to learn how to live in a way that glorifies God, our creator. Here we are. Bad stuff still happens. It doesn't seem fair. A man named Asaph in Psalm 73 had this very issue, and he found that while things look shiny now, There's vanity to their lives, for in the end it won't matter. So many of us struggle with perfectionism and seeking to live the perfect life to stave off any kind of catastrophe. We seek to be the perfect parent. We strive to be the perfect employee. We push to be the perfect Christian and then spread that perfectionism onto everyone around us in order to make ourselves feel better. If you would just do the thing the way I said to do it, We wouldn't be in this issue right now. We wouldn't have this problem right now. And then we allow that perfectionism to drive us further away from the grace of God instead of embracing the fact that Christ died because we're not perfect. And trusting that one day we will stand before the Lord and we will say it was not in vain. There is meaning. And it was good. We cannot stave off disaster. It's a fact of this sin-sick world that we live. Job, Bible says he was perfect. Lost his whole family, all of his possessions. Why? Because he and Satan had a discussion. There's no guarantee that the way we live our life, perfectly or frankly imperfectly, is going to protect us from the inevitable catastrophe of this world. Now, we make provisions for the potentialities of life in light of God's ability to protect us, right? It's like, look, at the end of the day, I'm holding everything with an open hand. I'm going to do what I can on my end to, to prepare for the day. But if God's will is something else, I'm going to embrace that, and I'm going to accept it. Because the posture of the heart of that person is different than the one who is seeking insulation, We often do this because we believe we have greater control than we actually do. And how much control do we have? Zero control. Zero control. The vanity of success, chapter 2, 18 through 26. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. How many businesses have you... A guy owns a business, gives it to his kid, kid runs it into the ground. All that work for something to get run into the ground. Yet he will, master of, he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. Why do we work so hard? The average lifespan for a man after his retirement, 16 years. 16 years. We work and we work to provide. We work to to do more and protect more and have more and have greater name and greater respect and leave a legacy for what? Vanity of vanities. And then we frame our lives around it instead of looking to the one who is the ultimate inheritance. When we strive for success apart from God, it is easy to eclipse so many other things. I sense this in my ministry even. Seeking success and working harder and making it the focus of my intention instead of God being the focus and my ministry being an outcome of that. Again, this is about the posture of our heart. There's nothing wrong with hard work. God wants us to do everything unto the Lord, but it becomes problematic when we consider why we are working and what we we believe it will achieve in our lives. 
Next, vanity of wealth. This is in chapter 5, verses 10 through 18. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage... More money, more bills. (laughs) And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Listen to this. Riches who were kept by the owner to his hurt. We're holding on to this deep desire for wealth and holding it tightly to our chest and it's burning us. We allow the quest for wealth to derive our value of ourselves. I'm wealthy, so I'm good. I have enough, so I'm okay. The problem is, is that there's no end. The very love of money continues to grow the need for more money, which then in turn grows more problems. We hear the phrases, follow the money. Money makes the world go round. Even Paul says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, money in itself is nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. God has blessed us and called us to be stewards of what we have. But when we're under the sun, when we're in an earthly perspective on wealth, all we can say is more. Because how do we ever ensure that we won't have catastrophe? How do we ever ensure that the next 10,000 we make won't be the part that tips us over into, I finally made it? So we push and push And what ends up happening, we get more and more, and it creates greater demands upon us. Do we own our possessions, or do our possessions own us? Solomon, the king, king of Israel, he had all of the accesses to riches beyond any of our wildest dreams, and he declares that money doesn't satisfy It is when we sever our pursuit of riches from our pursuit of God, the one who's infinitely valuable, that things go so quickly off the rails. So after we've done that joyful crest, what does Solomon say? What is the conclusion of the matter? He gives us a preface, he takes us on a journey, and he comes up with one final thought. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Solomon says, This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. He's made his case. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil. Solomon, after making his quest of life, being the wisest man on the face of the earth, having all of the riches that a man could ask for, the power that a man could ask for as king, all the pleasure, all the sex, all the stuff, all the honor that a person could seek after. At the end of the day, he said, none of it matters. It's all vanity of vanities. The only thing that matters is to fear God and keep his commandments. What does that mean? What does it mean to fear God when I've had people come up to me afterwards, a a message where I spoke about the fear of God and say, well, I I, I don't think we should fear God. We shouldn't be afraid of God. He's our father. Yes, he is, absolutely. But to understand this word fear... In the way that it's used in context in the scripture, we need to understand what fear means sort of in the original mindset of the people writing it, okay? Fear is most clearly aligned with that which we ascribe power to. We fear what is powerful, and we fear and we worship what we fear, okay? So whenever you hear the statement to fear God, it means to ascribe more power to God than to anything else, okay? There's a a passage in the book of Jonah where 
Jonah's running from God. God has told Jonah, go preach to the Ninevites. Jonah's like, I am not doing that. Why? Because you might be good to them. Kind of a shallow thing, right? So he gets in a ship. He goes the opposite direction. God's like, no, you're not going to outrun me. He sends a storm, and they start throwing things overboard because the ship's about to scuttle. He's on the ship with a bunch of foreigners, and everyone is saying, which God do you fear? Oh, I fear Dagon, the God of the Philistines. Okay, which God do you fear? I fear... So they're asking, who do you fear? The implication in that saying runs really close to what we're trying to describe here. What they're actually asking is, which God do you worship? Who is your God? Which God do you ascribe power to? When we fear God, it means that we are ascribing power to the creator Yahweh. It means that we are declaring that God is the only God, that my fears here on earth are secondary to my fear of him, that the things I worship here on earth are idolatry. The thing that is ultimately worthy of worship is God. It does not mean that we walk around as if God's hand is waiting to smack us and we cower before him. I hate to tell you, but this is something, I mean, I love to tell you, I should say. I love to tell you this. That smack already came down on Jesus. We deserve it. There's no question. But Jesus Christ absorbed the punishment for our sin. That's the whole essence. That's the whole core of the gospel message. It is the good in the good news. That we do not have to cower before God for any reason. So what does that mean for our fearing? It means that my punishment has been placed on Christ. And as a result of God's goodness and love for me, I will walk in obedience to him. I will ascribe power to the one who has saved me. I will ascribe power to the one who has created everything and the one who loves me no matter what. As Michael said, the foundation of our existence here. The fear then in turn leads us to a sense of gravitas, a sense of majesty and worship and reverence. But it begins with an understanding that God in his goodness has punished Christ instead of us. Some Christians seek to just drum this fear up. And what it does, it creates nothing but guilt. They walk around this world feeling constantly condemned and away from the love of God. But the, God that, or the fear that God desires from us is rooted in an understanding that Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Out of love. Solomon goes on and says, Not only fear God, ascribe power to God to worship the one and only God, but to obey him, to keep his commandments. Sometimes this can feel to us as if God is withholding. When the truth of the matter is, is that when we are obeying God and we are denying ourselves of something that God is warning us against, it really is an embrace of true life. When we deny the sinful things of this world, we actually embrace the shalom, the peace of God. Because God does not command us to withhold or to not do things or to do things that are really good for us. God commands us to do things that are going to hurt us. When we deny ourselves, when we pick up our cross, when we follow Christ and we live for him to keep his commandments, we find the peace that this quest was seeking. It's interesting. I looked this up. I couldn't come with an answer. But I see this in a lot of translations on this last, um, on verse 13. For this is the whole duty of man. The word duty is actually not in the text. It's not in the Hebrew. What it says is, for this is all of mankind. For this is the all of mankind. This is the significance. What Solomon is saying is this is everything. This is everything to worship God, to obey him as our creator. 
Now, to fear God and to keep his commandments, it's rooted in the idea of humility. And I'm going to close with this, little, with this idea, okay? Humility is the ground from which all of the virtues of life spring. It is impossible for us to live a virtuous life or to manifest a virtue within us that has not first been founded in humility. Humility is that dependence upon our creator as creatures. And I think when I stood before the eclipse, I think the, the feeling, that the, the word is humility. It was a sense that I am not my own. I cannot make my own decisions about what is right and what is wrong for me. I can. It's going to lead to vanity of vanities. That when I stand before my creator in humble dependence, when we look upon the God who created, when we find our significance in things above the sun, it is then that we find our true significance. And it's not surprising because pride is the ground from which all sin comes. Solomon's quest could have led him to nihilism and say nothing matters or existential despair or I'm just going to go do whatever I want because none of it is important. Instead, it led Solomon to a deeper dependence upon God. I've done the quest, I've made the search, and I'm here to tell you it's what they've been saying from the beginning. Fear God, keep his commandments. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've blessed us with the beautiful weather, the time together as um, a family, a body of Christ who are assembled in unity and love, all because of what Jesus has done. We admit openly, Lord, that we seek our meaning in all the wrong places, and so subtle it is because our heart is deceitful. Lord, Give us the eyes to see. Lord, as we sat here, as we continue to ponder what it means to walk in true humility and dependence upon you, to fear you and to worship you, to keep your commands, we pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us those subtle places, those lies that we tell us, that we say, if only this were this way, then I would finally have meaning, significance, or happiness. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the eyes to see, adjust our vision to see what true meaning in this world is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have uh, two more songs. This first one uh, is not for you guys to sing. The words are going to be up so you can follow along. Um, but uh, I just want to sing this over you. And I would, uh, yeah, just encourage you to stay uh, in, a, in a posture of prayer. Um, and it's my hope that you would be ministered to uh, by, by this next song. It's been the same thing from the start. Some new ember warms my heart, growing strong and bright till little by little it fades. And this cold that I've known lately is why I'm starting to think that maybe I'm looking for something. This world wasn't made to give It don't matter what you crave Be it decent or depraved You can eat your fill and you still won't be satisfied And this hunger I've known lately is why I'm starting to think that maybe I'm looking for something this world wasn't made to give. All the rich in their mansions, 
All the poor are straining hard All the wise within knowledge Every fool wandering round in the dark Every sinner and every saint They all yearn the very same Longing for a joy that won't ever fade away Oh, 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 oh. Won't somebody tell me what to do Before I spend my whole life through like a blind man dreaming still he'll find his eyes do i search high do i search low tell me where in the world do i go to find that something this world wasn't made to give to find that something this world wasn't made to give. So as you go about your day here under the sun, keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes looking upon the one who is your vision, the one who gives you the cheat code to life and how to find true meaning, happiness, and significance. Allow me to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for this gathered assembly of your people, Lord, and I ask that you would give them grace and strength to trust you, Lord. Help them to see their significance in you, that who sits above the sun, 
May they look to you for their meaning and purpose. May they find it, because you've promised they will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.